Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today to today's First Prin Principles on First Friday's lecture, an ongoing program sponsored by the Hillsdale College, Alan P. Kirby, Jr., Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. My name is David Bob. I serve as director of the center. Today we have uh, a most important topic, and I'm uh, pleased to welcome a, a good friend and, and colleague, John Fortier. I would uh, encourage you to, uh, if you're interested in pursuing the themes that he's going to be discussing today, the Electoral College, the National Popular Vote, all of the attendant controversy surrounding that, a very fair uh, overview of this whole debate uh, was put together by John a few years ago uh, for the American Enterprise Institute. It's called After the People Vote, a guide to the Electoral College. And it lays out in very succinct fashion the arguments for and against NPV uh, and for and against the Electoral College. It's a great debate and uh, pleased that, uh, that John is uh, able to join us today. We're going to continue the conversation for those of you who are with us in person after our uh, formal uh, presentation this morning. So we'll uh, change this room and have an opportunity then to continue the conversation over lunch for those of you who can stay. So we'd encourage you to, uh, to do that. The Hillsdale College lecture series on first principles focuses, as many of you know, on topics of timely import. And today, today's topic is particularly timely. We're now only one year out. Seems like a long time, but the election cycle, uh, such as it is, uh, this, uh, these months are going to go by very quickly. And indeed, more than half of the states necessary to put the national popular vote plan into action have already taken action. So it's a, it's a good debate, and, and we're looking forward to uh, this conversation. To introduce our speaker formally is Hillsdale College junior John Brooks who this semester is interning at the Heritage Foundation Center for Principles and Politics. John. Uh, John Fortier is director of the Democracy Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Previously, he was a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he also served as the principal contributor to the AEI Election Reform Project and the executive director of the Continuity of Government Commission. His books include After the People Vote, A Guide to the Electoral College, and he has been a regular columnist for The Hill and Politico. He received his BA from Georgetown University, his PhD in political science from Boston College, and has taught at Harvard University, the University of Pennsylvania, and the University of Delaware. Today he will be speaking on the topic of, is the Electoral College outdated? Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Fortier. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. And thank you to Hillsdale and the Kirby Center. Uh, I have had the opportunity in, in Washington before, uh, through David, who we've known since, uh, we've known each other since graduate school, to speak to Hillsdale students uh, in this program. But the last time I spoke to them, uh, it was a, a wonderful conversation, great students, but in, in more modest surroundings. And uh, David, at that time, took me uh, across the street here and, and showed me some, some townhouses. Uh, beautiful, great location, beautiful facades of the townhouse. But when you open the door, uh, the, the uh, wear and tear showed. It was uh, what you'd expect in a, I don't know how old, 100 year old or so townhouse. Well, I, I came back a few weeks ago and it was as if we uh, opened the wardrobe door and there was the world of Narnia before us or, or some remarkable place inside a door that, uh, that I, I, uh, had, I knew would be impressive. But uh, what you have here and what you've built both as a program but also a physical product uh, is, is really quite impressive. So I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you here and for those of you watching, watching from afar. Uh, David asked me to, to address a topic and I certainly want to leave some time for questions so I, I don't take all the time, but the topic is, is the Electoral College outdated? So I'm tempted to say no and just wander over here and uh, we'll, we'll have lunch and uh, so you know my, my cards are on the table. But I, I guess I, I'm going to take a little more time to, to lay out the case. Uh, first, to, to really think about what is the Electoral College. Uh, people, I think, know mostly what that means. But of course, that term is not in the Constitution itself. Uh, and I think all of what we mean by the Electoral College is not in the Constitution itself. Some of it is. Uh, some of it is uh, 
in, in the Constitution, some of which we've changed a bit. Uh, some of it is in uh, laws, federal laws, uh, the election day, when it's set, the dates then the electors meet, uh, some procedures that, that deal with how um, those, those electors are counted, electoral votes. Uh, congressional rules also affect that. Uh, if, if it comes to some disputed election, there are certainly things in uh, just Congress's rules, not in law, that, that affect the Electoral College. Uh, it's also the case that we have states, and I think states are, are something that we're going to talk a fair amount about today. Uh, states have a role in the Electoral College, but they've also made some decisions and individual decisions which shape the way we think about the Electoral College. Uh, the most important one being that most states, 48 of the states today, uh, allot, uh, allot all of the electors in their states to the winner of that state. Uh, that has not always been the case, does not have to be the case. A couple states do it another way. And as David mentioned, there is, there is an effort which essentially is looking to move towards a national popular vote, but is taking advantage. I don't, I don't necessarily think unfair advantage, but taking advantage of this idea that the states themselves have some say as to how those electors are allocated. So the Electoral College is not you know, just a, a one thing. It's not just in the Constitution. It's a whole set of things that we, we put together and has, has evolved into, uh, uh, parts of it have evolved uh, to where we are today. Uh, the, the constitutional part, I mean, why don't we talk about that first? Um, the, the constitutional part, I, I would say the essence of the constitutional part is that the, uh, the votes for president do not come all from, from one place, but come from 51 places, with the District of Columbia now uh, participating in the Electoral College. Uh, the, the votes in those jurisdictions matter for president, and the electors themselves, those who are coming out of the uh, elections that we have in November, those electors who finally elect the president, don't come together in one place. It's a misnomer to call it the Electoral College as if we thought everyone would show up in one room and have a vote and decide who is president. There are 51 different meeting places for electors. And again, um, you know, that, that shows some, some place of the, of the states in those, uh, those elections. Uh, have we, uh, there are also some backup procedures, and, and I, I guess I don't want to talk too much about them. I, I, certainly people who criticize the Electoral College criticize this, this portion of it. They say, well, what if there is no majority in the Electoral College? Uh, the presidency is thrown into the House of Representatives with a strange sort of way of voting. The vice presidency is thrown into the Senate. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, so I, I, not that I don't want to talk about that, but certainly it's not the major feature of the Electoral College. I don't think it's the major reason that, that people oppose it. Uh, but, but there are some constitutional provisions that say what happens if the Electoral College is not uh, successful in getting majority. Uh, and you know, again, on the Constitution, we've, we've made some changes, uh, the biggest one being the 12th Amendment in 1800, or after the 1800 election, the Aaron Burr and uh, Jefferson election. Uh, and I've been impressed by the network of, of people at, at Hillsdale College who know about my talk in advance and have actually sent me manuscripts. I've, I've, I've acquired some very interesting uh, pieces on the Electoral College just in the last week or so, uh, one of which uh, was making the case for the original Electoral College. Why, why not go back to that, that set of uh, laws? And, um, and, and essentially arguing that the, the current arrangement is too much connected to political parties. And I think there's, there's some truth to that. I don't advocate that, but I think there's some truth to the fact that the original Electoral College was a little different and didn't imagine that there would be two political parties. So, uh, you know, we've changed the Constitution in a, in a reasonably significant way in, in the 12th Amendment. Uh, but we've also made some other smaller changes, the 20th Amendment, which allows, which changes the dates of when the presidency comes in when Congress starts, thereby changing maybe what happens, uh, who counts the votes, the old Congress, the new Congress, uh, the possibility of thinking about what would happen to a president if the presidential candidate, the winning candidate died in the, the period between the election and the, the uh, January 20th inauguration today, uh, giving Congress the power to, to think about that by law. So there, there are a number of things in the Constitution that have changed a bit over time. Um, what about federal law? What, what kinds of things in federal law uh, affect the uh, our electoral college? And one, one I don't think that people think very much about is we have a single election day. Uh, I think many people think, well, of course we have a single election day. It's the, it's the first uh, Tuesday after the first Monday in November, every, every four years for president. Um, but it didn't have to be that way. Uh, in fact, early on, 
Just like in our primary system today, states would have their elections or selecting their electors in different ways, at different times. It was a rolling set of elections. So, you know, one thing federal law says and has said since about the 1840s is, hey, we're going to have one election day in, in November. And that's, you know, that's sort of part of our electoral college landscape. Um, the dates when the electors meet. We know that they meet in the states, and they tend to meet in the state capitals, but uh, when they meet is set by, by federal law. When the Congress counts the, the uh, electoral votes. Um, laws about presidential succession. I mentioned that if a presidential candidate or vice presidential candidate dies in the, in the interim, there are some laws that would help us figure out who might step in or, or who might be president on January 20th. Uh, or if somehow the election was not resolved at all, if we just had no resolution in the election, maybe, maybe there's a law that, there is a law that would tell us uh, what would happen. So there are all sorts of things in federal law. Uh, I mentioned congressional procedure. There are rules, some of which they've enshrined in law about how to count electors, what if they're disputed. So there's, there's some, some parts of that that are just in Congress's rules. Uh, and in the states, I guess I, here I want to spend a little more time uh, and think about the tremendous variation that's allowed for states. I told you that, that more or less since the, the early part of the 19th century, early to mid uh, 1820s, 1830s, states have tended to uh, allot all of their electors in a winner-take-all system. If you win Massachusetts by one vote, you get all the electors. It's not split proportionally. It's not done by district. It's almost always done that way. There are a couple of, couple of states that are exceptions, Maine and Nebraska. But it wasn't the case early, early on. And here you have a, a set of uh, systems that states had which are you know, very foreign to us, some of them district systems. Some of them, the legislature directly picking the, the um, electors. Uh, South Carolina actually was one that uh, continued to do that all the way to the Civil War. That was the last holdout in, in a state or two when they were coming into the Union that tried it that way for one time. Um, the, um, the systems where part of Maryland had two or three electors and the other parts were split one, two, and three. There are all sorts of systems that, that you could imagine to allot the electors. And uh, the court has more or less said, you know, this is, this is OK. States have a, a great amount of power as to how they allot their electors. Practically speaking, almost all the states are, are winner take all. But in the background there is this idea that states have the ability to, to decide how to, to, how, to, uh, so, um, how to assign electors. And so you know, to, to skip a little bit ahead and preview what, what might come up in the talk later, if, you, uh, if you're interested, changing the Electoral College, you might not have to change the Constitution, right? There might be things you can change in federal law. There might be things you could change in state law, and especially in these areas, how you would think about how you assign the electors. Uh, Maine and Nebraska, again, have a district system. They already do it. You may have seen in the newspapers, Pennsylvania has been considering moving towards a district system. Uh, but in a larger sense, this national popular vote initiative is thinking about the states in that same way, that states might have another way of assigning their electors, not based on who wins their state, but maybe based on the national popular vote. And that uh, I will get to, but that you know, comes out of this idea that states have a lot to say about the, the, the Electoral College and how electors are assigned. Um, there are sometimes, uh, I'll get to some reasons why I, I'm in favor of the Electoral College, but there are some who make a strong federalist case for uh, the Electoral College, that it is in some ways a, a real institution that defends states' interests. And I, I don't go quite that far. I, I certainly do think that there's a state component, and a state component that matters. But for the most part, because states don't pick electors directly, it's not really a state government component. It isn't something that says state government has these rights and the Electoral College by the way we elect the president is really protecting those. Uh, it tends to be the people of the states. The, the majorities of people through the country, most, most of our electoral college and way you think or the way we elect a president is really essentially a national vote. Most of the states' votes in the electoral college come from the population of the state. But there's a small component, uh, two electors, like two senators, from each state that comes from the fact that each state is a state. And that means that the, the people in each state have some say. The majority of, of, of a state, not the government of a state, but the majority of people in any election have some say about what a president uh, or who, who should be president. 
And I think that's you know, important in a number of ways. Um, not to defend really the prerogatives of state government as much as to say that we are in many ways a federal union, a national country, we have a national electorate, but we also do have majorities that rise up to throw out state governors or legislatures or change policy at states, and these are real components of our national policy that, that policymakers at the federal level should think about at least what the state majorities are, and so I think there's some, some value in that. There's also some value, I think, in uh, a, a minor point of federalism, but, but one you can imagine um, the alternative not being so good is that there's no one single place in Washington that runs elections. We think of elections, even though we have the Electoral College, we think of national elections, but there's no, there's the Federal Election Commission, there's the Election Assistance Commission, you can find these places in Washington, and they have some say about certain laws. But as for who runs elections, it's all done at the state level, certainly sometimes at the local level with state supervision, but the, but the primary jurisdiction is there at the state. And one thing that means is that there's no one place in Washington that is running an election. And if you want to make that less abstract and really put it down to, to concrete things, if a president is running for re-election, I don't want to pick on this president, President Obama's running for re-election, or President Bush is running for re-election in 2004, and the federal government is in charge of running the national election, the, the one, one single election, there certainly would be some doubts, right? People would say, is that president, is that government being fair? Are they tilting the scales in one direction? One advantage of our system uh, that it comes out of 51 different places is it's a whole bunch of different places, all controlled by different parties and some based on last election or some based on election a couple of years ago or uh, it's, a, it's a patchwork but it is also some ways not concentrated in one place. Uh, and again just to you know, reiterate this point, the, there's no place that we have a national electorate. Uh, the House of Representatives is, is an institution based on population. It is meant by the founders to be you know, broadly representative of the United States, not um, the states. But there are no districts in the House of Representatives that go across state lines. There are small inequalities between a district in Montana that will be because it only gets one seat slightly larger than a district in California. Uh, not the biggest inequalities, but again, states, li states lines in terms of election state control of how elections are run um, is something that pervades all of our federal institutions. So in a way, the Electoral College is not unlike that. Um, what are the arguments against the Electoral College? I, I'm sure you've heard them, but you know, first I think we should admit that the Electoral College is not a particularly popular institution. There are numerous polls, they've been going, you know, haven't changed significantly in the last 20, 30 years. You typically have 60, 65% um, against the Electoral College. They would rather have some sort of national popular vote. Now, I can make some arguments against that, uh, that it's not necessarily a burning issue for people. Uh, that in the 2000 election, for example, I think we rightly focused on issues of how we administer our elections, the voting machines and registration and all of the things that we weren't really paying a lot of attention to. We didn't really focus as much on the question of, well, did Al Gore get more popular votes than George Bush, even though some who were against the Electoral College wished we would. So maybe there's not a burning desire to do this, but I, I have no doubt that you know, the average view of the American people is it's not that they think we should have the Electoral College. It would be simpler to have a, a simple national popular vote. Um, and, and I know some, certainly plenty on the other side of the argument who say, you know, no state does this, right? You don't go into a state to elect your governor with this complicated system where part of the state has an elector and it's indirect, uh, that, it's, you know, that, it's, that it's something that's natural to us, that we, we have an executive office for the whole country, maybe we should have a popular vote. So, I, don't think you can make the argument that there's popular support for it, or that at least that there's not uh, you know, majority support for it. Uh, it's certainly against. Um, the, the first argument is that it's unequal, uh, that somehow the Electoral College is a problem because not everybody's vote counts the same. And that's, you know, there's some truth to that. As we know, the Electoral College gives each state two electors for being a state, and then one or more electors uh, based on its state population. So you can have a minimum of three. The smallest state, Wyoming, has, has three electors. Uh, California is going to have 55 electors. With, uh, and if you, do the, if you do the math, you do the ratio, you find out that um, 
the smaller state, a person in a smaller state has somewhat more of a, of a say. Um, and you know, I, I think this, in certain circumstances, would be a problem. But I, I don't think it's a problem today. And, and the reason I say this is uh, there are some smaller inequalities, but certainly compared to the Senate, the Senate is you know, extremely unequal that uh, the two senators come from the state of, of Wyoming, two state senators come from the state of, of California. The difference in population is you know, 40 to 50 times. And uh, the, you know, there's a significant difference here. In the very smallest states, there's, there's a, a little bit more of an advantage for, for each uh, a person, but it's not a large advantage. Um, and I, in, just, just looking, is it an unfair system? I think uh, one question to ask is, if this system were always making Democrats or Republicans on the short end of the stick of inequality, it would have a hard time surviving. I think it'd be hard if there were permanent interest which felt like the Electoral College was always stacked against them. And you can look um, to see that that at least is not the case today in the smallest states, because really the, the greatest distortion is in the states with just one uh, representative or two representatives. After that, you know, it's a relatively equal uh, number of votes per person. And, you know, those small states, if you look at the uh, seven states plus the District of Columbia who have three electoral votes, I think you could say five of them are Republican, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Alaska. You know, big election, maybe one of those could go the other way, but you know, pretty, pretty solidly Republican in an average election. And then uh, Vermont, uh, the District of Columbia, Delaware on the, the Democratic side, five to three. Slight advantage maybe for Republicans, but not so, not so far off. Uh, what about two electors? What about states with two electors? Um, you have Idaho, which is very Republican. You have Rhode Island, Maine, and Hawaii, which are very Democratic. And, and then you have uh, New Hampshire, which is, which is a swing state. So, you know, it's, it's not so different that the states are, are, the smaller states are not concentrated in just Republican hands or just in Democratic hands. And there, there are sometimes people who make you know, arguments about you know, which side is benefited or not. And I think it's probably true that the Republicans have a slight, slight advantage by having some more in the three, four, five, uh, I'm sorry, three, four, five representative or five, six, seven representative category, uh, elector category. But uh, those differences are quite small. So I think it's not an unfair system in terms of party. It's not an unfair system in terms of region. Those states I mentioned, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah, there are a few more, maybe in New England and the Mountain West, but they're, they're certainly scattered across the country. And you know, the argument that it's, that it's a burning problem against us because it's unequal, I think, is, is not one that, that is keeping people up at night. Uh, the biggest one, perhaps, the losing candidate in the popular vote can win. It's absolutely true. It happened in, in 2000. Now, I have some arguments against this, but I, you know, I want to make these, again, modestly, because I think if it were the case that regularly one party, again, was on the wrong side of this all the time, I think there would be a real reason to say, well, you know, there's some other virtues of the Electoral College, but it really isn't fair. It's really the system is, is keeping a, a major majority in the country from expressing itself. But it's extremely infrequent. Uh, it happened, of course, in 2000, but it hadn't happened in um, 100 plus years before then. Um, it's hard to imagine it happening other than the vote being this close. Certainly, you can do the math and try to find some, some outlandish scenario where there are lots and lots of states falling on one side by just a few votes and, and not on the other side. But realistically, it seems like we'd, we'd need to have a popular vote that was divided by less than a, a percent between the two candidates. It's not absolutely clear which party would benefit again. Uh, the uh, 2000 election, many people thought that it would go the other way if it, if it went that way, that, that Bush might be on the short end of the stick of the Electoral College, might win the popular vote. And then finally, if it's that close, uh, there is the argument, I think a good one, that, that candidates would have run their elections differently, right? If, if George Bush knew that he was trying to win the popular vote, he might have spent more time in Texas, run up the score there, maybe not as much in some other places. And when you're talking about an election that is decided by less than half of 1%, uh, there certainly are some opportunities for ways in which you could think that the electoral strategy would have been different. So uh, again, it's not, a, it's not a bad argument. It's one that I think resonates with a number of people. but it's not one that I think is underlying some tremendous unfairness between the parties, between regions, that is regularly keeping one party, one faction, one part of the country down uh, to the expense of the other. Some people say it's complicated. Um, 
it certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll pitch my book in this way. My book is meant not to uh, deal so much with the normal workings of the Electoral College, but all the abnormal workings, what happens if you know, there's a tie or a candidate dies or um, there's a disputed election. So there, there are all sorts of later mechanisms. But uh, I do think that people have the, the basic understanding that their vote in their state matters, that if they get out to help their candidate win their state, that that helps their candidate. And, and they may not know all the details, but it's not, a, it's not an overly complicated system in terms of the, some of the basics. Uh, two more arguments against it. One I, one I don't give much credence to, and the other one I do. Uh, one is that people lose their votes. People throw away their votes by showing up. A Republican in Massachusetts, for example, knows that his vote or her vote is a lost vote for the, for the Republican candidate. Uh, I'm not predicting, uh, I'm certainly Ronald Reagan did win in Massachusetts, but uh, today's climate, I think it, it would have to be a, a tsunami of an election for Republicans, for, for, uh, Republicans to even compete in Massachusetts. And so people say, well, those people have lost their votes. And similarly, uh, Democrats in Idaho and, and uh, very Republican places have lost their vote, have thrown away their vote because uh, of this electoral college. And I guess my, my argument on that is that that's actually an argument that, that people use when they think about the question of whether people should vote at all. Leave aside the electoral college. If you know your candidate's going to lose, is your, is your vote a lost vote? Well, in some ways it is, right? If, if you know that the election and the polls are all showing your candidate is down by 10 percent and you go out and vote anyway, your, your vote doesn't contribute at all to that, that particular office holder. When you vote for senator, you don't get 40 percent of that senator's vote because 40 percent of you voted for him. Um, and it's, it's the problem of any time we elect a single person in office. Some on the losing side get zero part of that. And there's, there's some argument when one talks about legislatures, which have a lot of people in them, that you've, in some countries we have proportional representation where the, the losing side gets a share of the votes. Um, but here we really have a winner-take-all system in almost every office, whether it's House of Representatives, Senate, or, or President. So um, the idea that, that somehow the Electoral College particularly encourages lost votes, I think, is not true. We, if we had a national popular vote system, there would be a way in which we could say the same thing. Anytime we have an office with one person, there are always people who are not going to get a share of that, of the winning candidate. They're, they're going to be on the losing side and, and have you know, essentially zero, even if they get 49% of the vote. The argument I think that, that we should take a little more seriously, one of the, the weaknesses of the Electoral College, and that we might think that there are some things that we want to change or around the edges or, or with state or federal law, not I don't advocate constitutional change in this area, is that, that we spend a lot of time in just a few states. Uh, that, that argument is made, and, and it is true uh, empirically, that if you live in Ohio, or now Virginia, where I live, which didn't used to be a swing state, uh, you would see ad after ad. You will be sick of political ads. You may, may already be sick of political ads, but there are states that really matter, right? There's a the handful of states, and whether that's 10 or 12 states or you know, slightly larger or slightly smaller number each time, it's certainly not 50 states. And the, uh, the amount of campaign resources spent in Alaska and uh, Vermont and very Republican and very Democratic places is a lot smaller than the amount that is spent in these swing states. And I think there's both a good side and a bad side to that, but I, I do have some worries about that. I mean, I do think that it, it would make sense that uh, we care you know, very much about all the states, that that people in a variety of places are motivated to participate and, and be part of this election that elects a president. Uh, and I do think that there are some, some, some worries about that. Now, there's some countervailing arguments, and I, I accept them, but I still think maybe there's some more we could do in this area. And the countervailing arguments are, well, sometimes these states change. They change over time. Uh, some states that are swing states today might not be in 10 years, 12 years. Some states that were once are not anymore. Um, there are other parts of the process. We have primaries, uh, a state like South Carolina might not be particularly interesting in the general election. I think the Republicans are probably going to win, but um, it's interesting on the Republican side. It would be interesting in a Democratic primary. It would be important, and we'd spend some time there. Um, there are places that people go to raise money, right? People go to states to find supporters and raise money, even if they don't think that state is very important as a swing state. 
California and New York get a lot of attention by both Republicans and Democrats in that sense. Um, and you do have the uh, uh, you do have the case that, that candidates are, are just generally uh, or, or, or people, citizens, are, are generally motivated to vote. We have low turnout by most standards, it's true, but there are lots of people in states who view it as a national election, who watch the watch the debates, who come out no matter what if their state is not uh, at play. Uh, it's true, absolutely, that the, that the turnout is lower in states that are not competitive, that are not swing states, but not dramatically lower. So there still is a, a, a core of uh, either civic virtue, or people want to vote, or that they think it's important as a national matter to, to express their opinion. Um, so I do think there's some countervailing arguments, but uh, I think it would also be useful to think about how we spread our, our votes around. Um, what are the arguments for the Electoral College? I mentioned them briefly, but I, I guess I make a more modest version of, of all of them. Uh, a kind of federalism, yes, but not one that says this is the institution that protects state government or state rights. As much as it is that we are a country, we have a, in some ways we have a national majority, we also do have these state majorities, state elections that bring in Republican governors or Democratic governors or bring in and out change in the legislature and change in policy. States are, unlike congressional districts, are real things, right? Congressional districts can change here and there. We're changing them now. We're, we're, we're uh, redistricting. They're, they can look different tomorrow. They have no real permanent status, but states do. And uh, so majorities in states, political cultures in states are part of our majority. They're not the whole of it. I don't argue that our, our national majority is just an assemblage of all the state's majorities, because there is a sense in which the office is federal as well as, as national. Um, but, but there certainly is something there in terms of wanting to have something about um, majorities, have presidential candidates care what matters to people in Ohio or, or close places. It's also something of a moderating influence. I, again, I. I have some, some worries that, that our candidates do not spend enough time in a lot of places, only in these, these swing states, but the swing states are places that are competitive, are somewhat in the middle, and if we're worried about our parties being out here and out here, or right and left, and not enough thinking about what's in the middle, uh, the focus on swing states is something of a pullback to the middle. Uh, yes, some of those states themselves can be polarized, but uh, focusing on them rather than simply trying to gin up your base in very very Republican or very Democratic places, it's not a wholly unhealthy thing. So I think there's a, a kind of modest federalism argument and a modest um, moderating element to the Electoral College. And there's another argument which I, I do make and I, I believe, uh, but is, is not always accepted, is that there is some support in the Electoral College for the two-party system. Um, there's argument about this because uh, there certainly is political science theory that says anytime you have two people running, in a winner-take-all election, leave out the, the Electoral College, just have a national popular vote, you're gonna tend to having two parties. Um, the systems that have many parties usually split up that vote and have proportional representation. You don't have to win one office. When you have one office, the, the, the center of gravitation is to have two ideas and competing for this. So it may be that other systems also help the two-party system, but what, one way in which our country being a large 50-state, very broad, diverse country, uh, is that it's hard, to, it's hard to be a national party just pop up overnight, right? You have, we have some people, Ross Perot, who became national figures, did reasonably well, created a party, but uh, I don't know if you've met any of the Reform Party people in Congress. There aren't any, right? The Reform Party has died. It, it's very hard to, to put roots in your, your party. And so uh, partly because of the Electoral College and having to win in more regions than one, you can certainly have a dominant base in a region, but you can't just be a southern party or just a northeastern party. You have to be successful in a number of places. You have to do reasonably well at state level. You have to have representatives. And the Electoral College, I think, makes it just that much, you know, that the, 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 the parties that come out of our system have to be reasonably broad, have some roots in a bunch of places, and it's hard to recreate. So I think it, it is, you know, somewhat supportive of the two-party system. Uh, and finally, I, there's, there are a few things that, uh, I would point to that just that we resolve things you know, more clearly. Uh, it's not that we never have problems. 2000, we had some significant problems, but uh, we had to resolve those problems in Florida. And 
One of the, well, I'll quickly talk about the national popular vote, but uh, if you imagine having a closer contested election that was a nationwide vote and try to think about the way in which we would try to resolve uh, ballots, close election, disputed things with different state rules, uh, the, the Electoral College in some ways limits that to a state or maybe, maybe a couple states, but doesn't allow this to be a, a wholly national recount. Um, so the national popular vote, just quickly, I think it's, it is the, the most significant challenge to the Electoral College. There have been people wanting to get rid of the Electoral College for quite a while, and essentially they felt the only way they could do it was by uh, amending the Constitution. If you changed it, essentially said, we are no longer going to elect electors. We're going to have a national popular vote. That, that's a very hard hurdle to, to get past. A couple, you know, two-thirds of the House and Senate, three-quarters of the states, and I know there are a couple other methods, but you know, basically a very significant supermajority to do it. What the, what the advocates of national popular vote have, have, I think, ingeniously latched onto is this idea that states have a lot of leeway. States may uh, have a lot of say in how their electors are assigned. And what they essentially are saying is, if a state wants to uh, upfront say, whoever comes into my state, I'm not gonna really base the electors on whether you win in my state or not. I'm gonna give, we're gonna give all the electors from, let's say the state of California, to the winner of the national popular vote. Uh, George, uh, John McCain could lose in, in California, but win nationally, and all of California's electoral votes would go to John McCain, even though the people of, of California had wanted Barack Obama. So it's, it's um, if enough states, the idea is if enough states do this, if states that add up to 270 electoral votes, uh, then essentially we'll have a national popular vote. We won't call it that. We'll still have electors from the Electoral College meeting in, in December, but those electoral uh, electors will all have been selected by this method that says states you know, look to the national popular vote, uh, select people who are loyal to that, and have, the, um, have those people vote uh, for the national popular vote winner. Um, Am I for it? No, I'm, I'm not for the Electoral College, uh, I'm not for the national popular vote uh, in any way, but um, is it unconstitutional? You know, I, I don't think so. I think courts have been pretty clear that it is allowed that states have great leeway in what they do with these, these electors. There are some people who make the case that uh, states couldn't just delegate their power to, to the opinions of other states. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I buy that. I, they, they, are, they are making some sort of decision as to what to do, that state by, by the state legislature passing this law, and I think the courts essentially would back them up. But there is, there is some disagreement about that, but I think most people would think it is constitutional. Is it ingenious? In some ways it, it is. Um, and you know, would there be problems? Well, aside from the, the arguments for or against whether you know, it's a good idea or not, uh, are there some practical problems? Yes. Um, uh, one people point to is, uh, and I, I don't actually think this is very serious, that these states are, are forming a kind of compact and they're agreeing that this doesn't take effect until a number of states do it. They're not, in California this time, even though it has just passed the law, is not going to give its votes to the Republican if the Republican wins. It's going to give it to the winner of the state unless all these other states agree to do it as well. And, and there's some question of the compacts clause in the Constitution that maybe that should be the talk of another one of David's lectures here, but uh, I think there are many ways for the states to get around that. Uh, that's not the big obstacle. Uh, what, one issue is, well, what about practical problems? What is the national popular vote? There really is no such thing. It's a number we come up with. It's a number that we go to the states and say, okay, tell us what the final vote was, and you kind of add it all up. Uh, but there's no one official vote, right? There's no place in Washington that keeps that. It's, a, it's a, something we can all calculate. Um, and for the most part, that doesn't matter in an election that's not that close. But uh, in an election that is close, it does matter a lot. Um, one states, and we see this in the electoral college, have very different ways of administering elections. Some vote by mail, some have longer hours, some have different rules about felons voting. Um, so all sorts of things can affect who shows up at the polls and who doesn't, how they count absentee ballots. Um, and so we would have a national popular vote, but we might have some very different rules in different places. And I think those who are for this don't appreciate that in a way a national popular vote means changing a lot of things, changing the, the states would have to have almost a very uniform system. And I think that's very hard to do. Um, it would be very hard to have a recount. I think that's, that's, a, that's a very 
obvious point. Uh, right now, states have laws about recounts, but it's only about their state. So if it were very close in California that uh, uh, California could recount its ballots between you know, John McCain and Barack Obama, but it couldn't force other states to have recounts. And so you could have a case where the national popular vote is very, very close, but no states are close, or only some states over there who don't even, who not even believe in this pa national popular vote are, are close. So <coughs> you could have a number of real practical problems with, with, this, with this national popular vote. Um, so, so I guess I'm, I'm going to end with that the Electoral College, I think, does deserve a kind of modest defense. It seems to work reasonably well. There's some problems with the alternatives. It doesn't seem to bias the case in terms of one party or the other or one region or the other. It, it embodies a kind of modest federalism that, that, that is worth defending. Uh, but it is worth thinking about, are there, are there some other things that, that might make the system more palatable. Um, I'm not explicitly in favor of the system that they have in Maine or Nebraska, which is to have some of the electors selected by state, some of them by district, but it might be worth considering. Uh, there, there are alternatives that might assign electors more on proportional basis. Maybe that would allow candidates to go to more states to, to try to win those states. Maybe they'd be interested in going to a broader group of states. So I think there are some small things that we could think about that would not uh, essentially change the idea of the Electoral College being a place that happens in 51 states where one cares about state majorities um, and that has a you know, somewhat indirect way of, of electing the president. I think that, that all could, could be still preserved with some modest changes. But I do think it's, you know, it's a very significant uh, uh, threat right now. Half, as David mentioned, half of the, half of the votes are there now, 49%. Uh, of the, the number that you get, need to get to 270 has been achieved by the people voting, uh, advocating for a national popular vote. I believe, of course, it will get harder and harder as you get closer to that, that 270 number. And I don't think the, um, you know, the traditional thought is that maybe small states will be for the Electoral College because they have a little more representation and big states will be against it. I think that's not the breakdown at all. I think if you look at the states that have, uh, that have that have advocated, advocated for it, you have you know, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Washington State, Vermont, and California, all essentially Democratic states. Uh, and th there are some exceptions. Uh, Tom Galasano, the, the um, uh, billionaire from New York who's on the conservative side of the aisle, uh, is, is for this. But for the most part, it's, a, it's more of a left-right thing. It's more of a, a traditionalist, worried about quality, debate rather than it is small state versus, versus large state. So I do think uh, you will likely see more purely democratic states pick this up uh, and it could get quite close. So if you're, if you're in a state and you're in a swing state and that, that state is considering this, I think that's, that's something to, to watch for. So um, I'm for the Electoral College. I think there's a modest defense of it that we should think about. We should be open to some small changes, but we should think about this um, larger change that is potentially affecting us, not for this election, maybe not for 2016, but, but is slowly gaining momentum and, and may end up through somewhat of the back door changing our electoral college to a, a national popular vote system. Yeah. And I think there are microphones, right? So I'm going to, can I just go right here? And, Thank you for a very interesting speech, but I wondered if you could comment on what was the wellspring that the Founding Fathers drew from for the ideas for the Electoral College. Well, it, it, I mean, certainly there, there is talk in the Federalist Papers that this is one of the most um, um, unobjectionable things. But I will say it, 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 was, it, was a, it was a combination of things that came together. It was decided late in the process, and it depended upon a whole lot of other things being decided first. So um, it, it certainly had to wait for us to decide what to do about our Congress. Uh, our Congress is a, is, a, is a compromise between the principle of representation, which is represented in the House. More or less, every district is equal. Every person is roughly represented the same way in the House of Representatives and representation in the states, which is equal representation in the Senate. And so the, the Electoral College has you know, something, of a, something of a mix of these things. 
It was also true the, the original Electoral College was a little different than, than ours. And so the original Electoral College, you had uh, these electors had to vote for, uh, or you could elect essentially two electors, and they, they believed you wouldn't have political parties. And so one, one of the thoughts was, you might just know somebody from your own state, uh, not a country that, that everybody could hear about what was going on in Georgia if you lived in Massachusetts. But then you had to have a second vote for somebody who might be a, a national figure. And so you had uh, the thought that you'd have you know, lots of local candidates running, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't win. And a few national candidates might be able to get those, those second votes. And related to that was that without the idea of political parties, the, the second place candidate became the vice president. It would be as if you know, Barack Obama had John McCain as his, as his vice presidential candidate because uh, that was the person who had the second most support. Uh, now, the, the people who sent me the manuscript about the changes in the Electoral College after 1800 are right to say that, that our current system recognizes parties more. We have the, the people run as a ticket, right? But um, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know their manuscript um, as well as I should, but uh, some might say, well, it caused that. I don't think it caused that. We, we talked about not having political parties but within a few years, they developed very quickly. And so our, our system and how they fit, it fits with political parties is often a little bit, a little bit difficult to, to, uh, to put together. So they certainly wanted to encourage people of great stature, of national stature, not just local people in states. Um, they wanted to have a, uh, a role for, or a place for this, this mix of state and uh, national, rep uh, national representation that they, we see in the Congress represented uh, in the presidency as well. Um, and, you know, and, and ultimately, I think they thought that, that finding big national significant characters was, was one of the, the virtues of the system and you know, has, has something of that today. I, mean, I think we can forget about today that we have you know, media and ways of getting famous, but there is a way in which you do have to have some presence in a number of places today to become president. You can't just be a regional candidate. You can't just be a television candidate without office. You have to have, to have some of that. And at least that spirit, I think, is still, uh, was still present in, in what the framers wanted. Uh, okay, I'll, how about I go back here? I'm trying to remember, don't, aren't uh, electors required not to be federal employees? And I don't I'm trying to figure out if that was a tradition or actually a matter of one of the requirements. Um, they are not allowed to be uh, office holders, right? Uh, so you can't be, um, I don't know that they can't be federal employees, but you cannot be office holders. So you couldn't, uh, these are funny, it is a separate institution and you hold office. I mean, you hold office for a very short period of time and you, you cast your vote and you don't continue on. Some people, I think, uh, tried to portray the Electoral College as more of a, a place that would all come together and meet a kind of legislature. Not that, but uh, it was meant to be independent of state government and independent of federal government. So uh, uh, I, I think, again, the idea that the people, even, even though in one way the state legislatures could select them, they're not doing it themselves. So it's a, it is an independent body that gets selected. And, I didn't bring this problem up today. Some people worry about this problem of the faithless elector. Sometimes these electors maybe not voting the way we think they're going to vote. They're supposed to vote for Bush. They vote for, you know, they vote for um, John Kerry, and and it has happened over the years. And and I you know I think potentially potentially a problem, um, but there are some 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 problems on the other side, especially if one starts thinking about well what happens if the if the presidential candidate dies or something really horrific happens in terms of reputation in the, in the meantime. Uh, there might be a, you know, some very extreme cases where there would be a, a need for these electors to, to change their minds. But yes, they're not supposed to be federal. They're not supposed to be state office holders. They are supposed to be um, independent of the, the, the traditional workings of both. Uh, I'll go here and then here. I have to just try to get the microphone around here. Uh, with regard to one of the arguments against the college that you take seriously, that it makes some states more important than others. Uh, couldn't one make the same, a similar response to that that you made to, to the argument that your vote is wasted, right? That it simply relocates the problem to a lower level. So then it would be that major cities become more important than rural areas. And in this regard, it's 
it, it doesn't have much force. No, I, I think that's a fair point. Uh, I mean, one, one argument that's sometimes made about the Electoral College is that um, if it weren't for the Electoral College and we had a national popular vote, candidates would never show up some places. They would really only run media campaigns nationwide. They would only focus on the big population centers. And, you know, I, th I think that's more or less true, that there would be a reallocation of resources. Um, uh, of course, some of these places that are that are um, uh, you know that, that that are getting attention today would be uh, you know different than they were. So so I, I do think that that um, you know there's some some truth to that. What I guess I wonder is, I think there's an argument for saying candidates should care about the majorities in each state. Um, it shouldn't be their only concern, but it, it it's worthwhile knowing that this country is not just a bunch of people in Ohio who happen to vote for, for federal office, that they actually have some say over their, their local affairs. They make laws. They elect officials. So, so the president having some, some basis for his election in that makes some sense. Um, the problem is, I guess, if you, if you think that only a few states are swing states, you kind of take for granted those majorities in the places that you have the advantage or the other side has the advantage. And uh, so to the extent that you could get people to take a, a somewhat broader array of states more seriously uh, wrestle with their political cultures. Uh, you know, the, it probably wouldn't be the most extreme ones. The Idaho's and the and the uh, Massachusetts probably wouldn't get much attention. But you know, there are states that elect there are Democratic states that elect Republican governors and vice versa. And you know, having having a little bit of, of of ability, whether it's because you could win a few electors in some states or a few districts in some states, you know, it's something I want to look at. I mean, I, I'm I'm open to this, and we uh, have a group that, that may do some, you know, some empirical research and just try to figure out, well, how many places would be competitive in these other systems than not. But I, I want to hold on to this idea that you care about states. I think there's a moderating influence in the, the fact that the swing states are places that are you know, toward the middle that the candidates should, should try to persuade. Um, but you know, another side of me says, boy, 10 or 11, and we don't have as many swing states as we used to. And that's, partly a function of our, our polarization and where the states have moved. And I think it's, it's a worry that uh, it'd be better if we had a slightly broader campaign at the federal level. Oh, yes. Sorry. Here. Hi. If I recall correctly, in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton commented no, not only about the people who were desirable to have as electors, but also that we needed to take great care, and we're talking about a long time ago, we needed to take great care that there were not foreign entities that were included in this group of supposedly virtuous people. What foresight they had, and uh, is this affecting anything right now with the electoral colleges? people from other, not only other countries, but other cultures? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, certainly uh, every state has, uh, uh, there, there, is a, there is a law essentially that you have to be a US citizen to, to vote in federal elections in states. Um, that is not in the Constitution, I will note. So you do not actually have, I mean, a state could move towards having um, resident aliens be part of the federal electorate. It, it, they don't choose to do so, but they could choose to do that. Um, you do have some cases of states uh, or localities having elections where they say, well, you're not an American citizen, but you are a longtime resident here, you're a legal resident, or here for whatever purpose, you're part of our community, you can vote. So um, it's not uh, because, of, because of law, not the Constitution, uh, citizens, at least, not legally, Le legally citizens can, uh, non-citizens cannot vote in, in federal elections. Um, people worry about this in the case of money. I mean, trying to regulate how money comes into the system. Some who, especially on the, on the side of more um, campaign finance regulation say, well, you know, we do have to know something about who's giving because we don't want foreign interest giving. We want only people who are here uh, in America giving. So, and, and, and law, federal law, again, does prohibit that. It's not to say that some people can't get around that. There aren't, there aren't some, some, some leakage in some of these areas. But uh, the, the federal electoral college or our electoral laws in general are, 
essentially for American citizens to vote. Uh, and yes, of course, there are people who have come here and become American citizens uh, who are considered just as American citizens as people who are naturally born. So they're, they're as equal as anyone else in terms of this process. But um, they are, uh, you know, our, our laws, even though the Constitution hasn't absolutely required this, do reflect uh, this idea that you're, that you're saying. Uh, this is the final question. Uh, with due, due regard to how much flexibility the states have over their voting, uh, I, I really get depressed when I go home after an election and I hear reports about voter fraud. And as I understand it, the voter fraud is coming from two sources. Uh, it's, some of it is uh, defined and it's done on purpose. Others, it's, it's done because uh, by default. Um, in defined, people are showing up at the polls and apparently being allowed to vote uh, when they're not registered or not even citizens. And apparently the states, some states have tried to uh, counter this by a voter ID. Uh, by default, a lot of states are simply letting uh, voter rolls go unchecked. What does the Constitution say about Congress stepping in and making some of the rules about voting in the different states as it applies to presidential elections make some uniform criteria so that people in one state aren't defrauded by def uh, false elections in another state. Does the Constitution allow Congress to step in and let's say have some uh, defined regulations about voter ID, have some uh, defined regulations about how, how much you have to clean up your voter rolls, et, et cetera? Thank you. Um, Yes, it's actually sort of an interesting clause in the Constitution that um, essentially it says that states may make laws regarding the times, place, and manner of elections, but then federal, the federal government may also make laws which would, would trump them. Um, and so at least the, the order of that clause and our history has been something following that, that traditionally states have the, the role, the, 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 the um, primary role in this, but there are some areas where the federal government has stepped in. Um, certainly there are uh, laws, civil rights laws, there are uh, campaign finance laws. There's a law I mentioned about having a, a uniform election day. You know, so that, so that there are some things Congress weighs in on. Um, and we did, after 2000, think very seriously about how we hold elections. And you know, that, there was a compromise major bill here that some Republicans don't like some things of it and some Democrats don't like some things, which, which did federalize things a little more, certain, certain things about how you, um, th there's a small aspect of how you would have to show an ID if you've never shown one when you registered in the first time. And so, so there, there are some things that the, the federal government could do. Sure, it, it could weigh in in a very significant way in this. I don't think it's very likely. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote an, another book, which is uh, even less, uh, less of a bestseller than After the People Vote, called uh, uh, Absentee and Early Voting, uh, Promises, Perils, and Trends, or I, I've got the subtitle wrong, but um, <laughs> it's a, um, I, I think there are some issues uh, with people showing up at the polls, and, and you know, that, that's something we should care about. I have more worries in some ways about some of these alternative methods, especially absentee voting, right? That's, that's something that, um, uh, we had some significant debates in the 19th century about the secret ballot, and there are good reasons for absentee ballots, but uh, there are also some potential uh, downfalls to it and why the polling place gives you some more protections. Um, in general, election laws and election administration are still incredibly state-based, so you are right. Um, we, we, have, we have shoddy registration uh, lists. Uh, partly because they're hard to keep, partly because we have some laws that say we want to be sure we keep people on there just in case, you know, even though we might think they might have moved or I'm not sure if they died, we're, we're extra careful in removing them. So, so there are a lot of reasons why we have uh, people on the election uh, law uh, rolls that, that might not even belong there. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's hard to measure outright fraud and people showing up and impersonating. And I think a lot of people on the other side of the argument say, well, there's not that much evidence of that. Uh, but it's certainly true that the, uh, the registration in this country is something that is just uh, antiquated compared to any other country. Um, and maybe with our laws and a lot of money that we've spent in the last 10 years, we might be moving to the point where a state might be able to figure out if you're registered twice in the state. 
but we certainly couldn't tell you if you're registered here in one state and in another state or registered in your maiden name and, and also in your, your current name. And so, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of problems in that. And so, um, this is one issue. It's not, I guess I would, wouldn't say it's at the level of the electoral college, but, um, one issue that, that both sides of the, if you want to say one side cares about access to voting and rightly so they care Well, people who were registered, but their name didn't get on right, or they're being turned away from the polls unreasonably or people who think, well, the, the rolls are bad, people are showing up or voting absentees that they shouldn't and we don't know who's voting, we're not keeping good track. They both have a point, right? So, so in some ways improving those lists and finding ways of, of knowing who really should be able to vote um, and allowing them to vote and also keeping off people who are not eligible or, or duplicate names is something we should, we should work on. But it's, uh, we barely sort of scratch the surface of doing it at the state level and we certainly have no, no federal ability to do that. Good. Thank you.